It's Gabriel. It's Bailey. And this is CYMK. All right, today we are joined by John Schoonover and Louise Smith, grandchildren of Frank E. Schoonover, painter, illustrator, and photographer whose artwork can now be viewed in Sampha's Gallery One. Our exhibition, N.C. Wyeth and the Golden Age of American Illustration, will be on display until March 31st. We are featuring works from Frank Schoonover, right alongside the work of N.C. Wyeth and teacher Howard Pyle, whom Schoonover and Wyeth studied with. Frank E. Schoonover produced thousands of paintings through his long career, many as illustrations for written works that ran the gamut from science fiction to magazine articles. He was also a teacher, a designer, and a landscape painter, and helped organize what is now the Delaware Art Museum. All right, John and Louise, so can you both tell me a little bit about yourselves? Well, thank you, Bailey. We're really thrilled to be back in San Angelo after 17 years, which was our first visit here to see Joel and Suzanne Sugg. Oh, wonderful. Because Joel was a very serious collector and admirer of Frank Schoonover and N.C. Wyatt. Mm -hmm. So um, my sister Louise came and we brought a photographer, Greg Staley, and photographed all the Frank Schoonovers in their collection and had just a lovely three or four day visit and uh, are now back again to see the paintings in the museum. And uh, that's a Beautiful museum, and it's somewhat nostalgic for us, I'm sure, to be back, right? Absolutely, Uh, absolutely. Well, my name is Louise Schoonover-Smith. That's how I tie into Schoonover. And uh, as you know, I'm uh, John's sister, and I'm delighted to be back here, Bailey. Thank you for the kind introduction of my grandfather. Uh, We have loved studying for the last, since 1999, his life, because we compiled and did all the research for A Catalogue Raisonné, which, of course, you know is a book that covers his whole oeuvre, all of his works, as much as we can find, which is, of course, why we were here uh, in San Angelo visiting the Suggs, Mm -hmm. because uh, we brought our photographer, our professional photographer, Greg Staley, uh, to photograph all of Joel's schoonovers mm-hmm. wherever they were here in uh while they were at the ranch they were at the at the office they were at uh, his home so it was such a wonderful wonderful experience uh, I come to this uh I'm married we have four children we have 12 grandchildren we have three great jo- grandchildren wow. <laughs> and many in-laws and not too many outlaws I hope but <laughs> <laughs> But in any case, uh, I taught school. And while I was teaching in the 1990s, my brother kept saying, you've got to quit that job. We have got to write a catalog race today. Oh. It, this needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And, and you need to come down here and help us do this. And so that is what we did. We formed a nonprofit corporation, the Frankie oh, wow. Schoonover Fund Incorporated. And we uh, had a number of people over the years on our board uh, of course, John, uh, my husband George, is the treasurer. Our brother is the vice president. And then we have uh, people who are involved in the art world, uh, restorers, conservators, uh, art museum uh, directors, all kinds of people have been on our board and have helped us uh, support and and in, the, in 2009 publish our Ten years raisonné. later. Ten years later. It took Ten that long. Ten years later. Right, because we lived in northern New Jersey, yeah. and all the work was done in Delaware. So we commuted back and wow. forth. And John had a business full-time also. And um, so we're delighted to be here to share any information about my grandfather that you might be interested in knowing, because I've got stories. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so does John. <laughs> Man, well, of course, fortunately, I uh, have been curator of his original studio in Wilmington, where N.C. Wyeth also painted in the early uh, 1900s. So it uh, is a a historic art studio that people, and including illustrators, current working illustrators, come down to as a a kind of a destination. Yeah. Because uh, when you walk in, it's almost exactly like it was when my grandfather passed away in 1972. So it's it's unique, and it still is 
a gallery because that's my business is uh, brokering, collecting and brokering and documenting American illustration. What a wonderful thing that it's remained intact and in the same way that it was used. How wonderful is when that? When you open the front door, it smells <laughs> it of smells the like oil varnish. painting. It smells oh, like the varnish. The oil paint and varnish. And just that one little spot completely just goes, whew, just <laughs> wakes you up. You're in an art studio. <laughs> oh, gosh. How beautiful. So, okay, can you tell me a little bit about... Did you spend a lot of quality time with your grandfather growing up? Did you have any good stories about that? So uh, I remember him as, uh, you know, a wonderful man who carved the turkey at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And um, uh, I think um, my sister, whose nickname is Phoebe, by the way, if I say that wonderful name occasionally, if I may, um, probably stayed at the house in Wilmington, which was 25 miles north, more often. Um, and it wasn't until I got out of, graduated from the University of Virginia that I spent more time at the studio with my father and um, got to really understand the, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, the reputation that my grandfather mm -hmm. had as an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, because they didn't even mention him in the art history course I took. And I went, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> but they didn't mention a lot of illustrators except for Norman Rockwell okay. and maybe Howard Pyle, who was um, really taught over a hundred uh, great American illustrators. So, mm -hmm. um, so that and some visits to the house in Bushkill, Pennsylvania. But I think... Uh, Phoebe may have a, a couple more unique ones, shall, shall I say? Yeah, as, as long as my, uh, that I knew my grandmother and grandfather. Uh, my grandmother was an angel. She looked like an angel. She was an angel <laughs> <laughs> because she had an artistic husband. <laughs> and that sometimes takes a little organizing and giving, which she did beautifully. Uh, they were uh, living in this uh, two-sided house you know, a very lovely area. And I went to private school, day school in Delaware, which meant commuting. And sometimes I would stay at their house. Yeah. But I remember even as a, as a child going up to visit my grandmother and grandfather in their house. Uh, my grandfather was an illustrator until the 19, well, the 30s, things started waning off, you know, in illustration. And photography came into mm -hmm. uh, use in m many of the, of the magazines. And so the illustrators had to find something else to do. So my grandfather became, uh, uh, he, well, he had many actual types of jobs. One type was he uh, designed uh, church windows, stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. And he also did artwork for calendars and things like that. But in 19, beginning of the 1940s, he became a teacher. So he used his studio as a school. And uh, I remember, this is a absolutely funny memory to me. I remember going on a Saturday when he had his classes for children and he had Dr. Dan Preston, who was one of his, one of his students who came on a Saturday because he asked him to, to come and paint my, uh, my photograph, not my photograph, my picture. And so uh, by I, the way, excuse me, Dr. Preston did my appendectomy <laughs> in 1962. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Dr. Preston had me sit in a chair and he painted and he painted and he painted and he must have, I've sat there, I'm sure for an hour and a half and I was such a good girl and I was only maybe eight or nine at the time. And when he finished, grandfather came over to look at the painting and he was furious because Dan had painted my picture, but had missed the top of my head, stopped about there. Oh, no. And he said, what, what have you done? You, you've <laughs> missed it, Dan. You've missed it. <laughs> so in any case, oh, he had uh, wonderful students, many of whom are noted artists in the Delaware or Delmarva area of Delaware uh, and uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania. And um, he was a, a comedian and a storyteller. 
uh, I remember going to his house and uh, staying over at this house and going out in the backyard. He was also a gardener. And he had this wonderful flower garden out in the back. And I remember I went out and I decided I would find out about flowers. So I started asking him, him questions. <laughs> and so I kept asking him about these various flowers, and he was starting to get irritated. I knew I should have stopped, and I didn't stop. And he he just looked at me and and to answer one question, and he grabbed a flower and he broke it off. Oh, oh you've ruined my columbine! <laughs> oh my goodness, I felt so terrible. I went rushing in the house to my and, grandmother. <laughs> meanwhile, of course, he was painting hundreds of landscapes. Oh, yeah. And that, uh, those later years of the uh, Delaware and uh, Upper uh, upper Brandywine and Upper Delaware River Valley, oh, yeah. which is a magnificent watersheds in our neck of the woods up there. Right. Shortly after he was married, uh, his father helped him find a beautiful piece of property and home uh, in Bushkill, Pennsylvania which is, as John said, just uh, near the Delaware Water Gap Mm -hmm. between uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And um, I remember we would go up there when I was a child, about the same age, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And one story I remember clearly was that there was a stream, the little bush kill that ran behind the house. And this is a very large, several acres of property. And that behind was the studio where he had his, his uh, uh, was a barn the with barn, a studio yeah. in it. He said, okay, come out in the morning. I'm going to teach you how to fish. I said, okay. I went out and I got the pole and I put the, he showed me how to put the worm on the hook. Oh. And I stood there and sure enough, some poor little fish came and grabbed that thing. He said, pull it up, pull it up. So I pulled it up. There I had the fish. I was so excited. I went rushing in to tell my grandmother. I caught a fish. So later, it was time for breakfast, and we all sat around the table, big old table, in this old house. And uh, was it, who was it? Ollie? What was the name of the person who came over and cooked at the house? Lee. Oh, Lee. Yeah. And Lee came in and brought my breakfast. It was my fish oh, no. that I had caught. <laughs> And I didn't, I, I don't remember having ever eaten fish before. We didn't eat fish in our oh house. And I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I didn't know how to take the bones out. I didn't know how to eat this fish. So anyhow, that was traumatic, but yeah. very exciting. <laughs> it's a good life lesson to eat what you kill and use all the parts <laughs> use and the all that stuff. <laughs> so those are the kinds of experience we would have. Yeah, he would take sort of- us by uh, canoe. Uh, or rowboat over to the New Jersey side of the uh, Delaware River and to Sandy Beach. And he he did a number of paintings of the actual area where we would uh, take off and go across the river to Sandy Beach. He included Sandy Beach in a number of his landscapes. Uh, He rarely included any vehicles in his landscape. Almost all vehicles were removed you know, mm-hmm. just like you'll use this tape and and you'll take some things out and put some <laughs> things in. And that's exactly what he did with his paintings. And one day, uh, he uh, a man told he told us about a man who came up to him uh, and to his studio, and he liked this one landscape. He said, "I'll buy that landscape from you if you'll just put in a red boat and me." And so he said, "Okay." So he did. Oh. So we have this one landscape wow. with a man with with a man and a red rowboat. Uh, but almost never did he put any vehicles, um, sailing or anything else. Yeah, I think just hearing you tell those little stories, is, which are so wonderfully personal, is that in the broader sense, as we said here today, little did we realize the extent of our grandfather's career and illustrative uh, importance as an artist— uh, in a, a really remarkable way, which the catalog raisin A certainly captures. Mm-hmm. And now, as we sit here looking at this whole sample, his work as a photographer, which we now have kind of rediscovered as another one of his remarkable talents, uh, was extremely important in his work and also on a social documentary scale in terms of his, all the photographs he took, because he took his camera everywhere he went, even Bushkill, which will be included 
in the uh, uh, publication, hopefully next year. Yeah. Oh, uh, what publication is that? Oh, well, that'll be through his own lens. The, uh, Excellent. The work of social documentary Frank Schoonover. Yes. So we've sort of taken the first big chapter of Frank Schoonover as an illustrator and then sort of filled the story in with um, his over 5,000 photographs yeah. that fortunately have been um, documented and cataloged and uh, and we feel need to be uh, brought out into sort of the public domain. Absolutely. Oh, how wonderful. Okay. Um, so... I know that you had him as a grandfather and you got to experience all those beautiful memories and those memories in themselves kind of shaped who you thought of him as a person. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything that you kind of learned about him through his artwork later on as you were documenting all of his photographs and his paintings that you didn't know growing up or just something that kind of learned you to lead more about him? Well, I'd say primarily his extraordinary travels, uh, which showed uh, an, uh, an adventurous spirit and an endurance that included uh, four months up in the great Hudson Bay area uh -huh. as, as really, a, um, I would call it a novice adventure, but he just took off a thousand miles north uh, to photograph and study the indigenous tribes up there because he had an intense interest in the Canadian um, history and culture. And uh, a lot of those photographs will exhibit that. But uh, he survived because we have his diary, almost four months of intense cold wow. and breaking trail with guides in a very hostile environment and yet encountering many of the tribes, the Cree, Ojibwe, in a very personal way, and coming home with all that material, and then paintings um, relating to the Canadian experience written by Canadian uh, writers for magazines and books. Um, and, and that in itself shows you uh, how... Uh, Again, durable, durable's not the perfect word, but how he could survive that kind of environment yeah. in an artistic sense also, as well as a physical yeah. experience. He seemed like the true meaning of adventure. Well, that and maybe a little of the Renaissance man, because he actually created 22 sketches, I think, while during those travels on in wax crayon. Yeah, about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which was not an easy task. Right. So, so you know, sort of an early day survivor, I would say. So you may ask, why did he do that? Well, he was an adventurer, but his mentor, Howard Pyle, who, yeah. who was his teacher, said, if you're going to paint it, first experience it. Yeah. And that way you will know what you're doing and you'll do it right, and you'll be authentic. He wanted to be an authentic illustrator, have it as close to what it would have been had that story happened in real life, because many of the stories, of course, were fiction, but uh, some were not. Mm -hmm. uh, his whole adventure with that he wrote of Jean, the pirate Jean Lafitte. Yes, yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Okay, well, I won't go into that, into that uh, now, so I'll wait till you come up with that one. Your turn. Okay. <laughs> you got me excited about Jean Lafitte. Okay. Well, actually, that's a perfect segue. Can you tell me about what he learned in his research about into Jean Lafitte, the pirate? Well, for one but, thing, we, we want to tell you that uh, he went to down to Louisiana yeah. as part of a trip uh, for my grandmother, to take my grandmother on a honeymoon. Uh, <laughs> and so here's how the honeymoon went. He, they would get up in the morning, he would send her to the library and do the research, and he would go out and l 
look at all the areas where the pirates lived, the, wow. you know, and the boats and the lanterns, and, and he photographed them and later did many illustrations for Jean Lafitte, some of which are in the Biggs Museum, which has a special schoonover gallery. Uh, and there are many wonderful uh, Jean Lafitte paintings there, or several there, mm -hmm. and other places. But uh, that's some kind of a honeymoon. Yeah, yeah, go to the library yeah. and just do the research, dear, <laughs> and and we'll come up with a story to match my paintings. <laughs> right, right. And I'll talk to pirates. <laughs> yeah, I'll go talk to pirates and feel the grass and oh you know, my gosh. <laughs> look at the pirogue. That's a that's a boat that he that they use the uh, pirates used. Yeah, um, there'll be a chapter one of fourteen or fifteen in our book. Um, that will focus on the John Lafitte experience. And Bill Cullen, our uh, co-author, has done a remarkable uh, research into that and linked John Lafitte to the current ethnic, uh, you wouldn't call it tribe, a community there who were shrimp uh, fishers and shrimp oh. workers. And uh, our grandfather uh, photographed those shrimpers. That was, again, around the... 1906 uh, or yeah. seven when he mm -hmm. went down there mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, wrote the story. Uh, but there's a backstory that'll be in that chapter. Again, uh, even going beyond social documentary into ethnog ethnography. There's a tough word for you. Right. The ethnography, again, is uh, a word that, that sort of covers the um, those communities that are still very evident today in these areas, and that's certainly one in, down in the bayous of uh, Louisiana. Yeah. When I do a uh, presentation about my grandfather as an illustrator, uh, one thing that I note during that time is how he was diligent about uh, following once again, his mentor, Howard Pyle, in putting red in the center of the action. And you'll Schoon notice when... Schoonover red. Schoonover yeah, red. Yeah, yeah. And when, the, when Jean Lafitte is in, the, uh, in his hammock, uh, you know, kind of just lounging about, uh, you'll see all these diagonals. And, and that's another little thing that I point out, that the diagonal movement in, comes toward the center, always toward the pirate. And... Uh, other other times, even in where you don't suspect it, you'll find the red. Mm. You know, even out in an, in his pirogue, you'll see where the red comes out. The little uh, on the lantern, and it, it's really quite amazing how he's used that. Yeah. And, like and I my, love finding that out about my grandfather. You asked me what things did we find out. Well, that's one thing that I found out: how he, how clever he was, and how purposeful he was in his illustration, and what an amazing storyteller he was with almost every illustration. To my mind, once I found out about the story and I looked at the illustration, I said, "He got it." Yeah, <laughs> but you know, every illustration, uh, but not every one, but many illustrations don't tell what happened. They tell what's going to happen. Oh. Why do you think? Storytelling? Uh-huh. Why do you think it tells what's about to happen? Is it so you can mm -hmm. infer for yourself? That's one thing. Good. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is to keep the reader reading. Oh, yes. That reading was the whole the, uh, idea. Keep the, the reader reading that keep story. Them on the edge of yeah, yeah. yeah, keep them reading the whole serial. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was one of the yeah. uh, duties, really. Of the illustrator. And, and to do that in one solo image. Right. Although one painting. Be, make the, you know, t tell the story you know, almost up to that point. Right. And then make the reader want to look, see what's going to happen yeah. next. Turn the page. Oh, how wonderful. Anyhow. So yeah. The, the schoon over red, I have heard of that, that term before. So he used that to create a focal point and to kind of draw your eye through the painting to kind of help. Mm -hmm. That story was sort of a know. signature, and he did that in, in his er, very early drawings. There would be a little, a little uh, red wash, red wash, uh, uh, just a little um, sort of a uh, sort of a highlight. Mm. Is probably another good word for that. Why red? Do you know? 
Well, that was Howard Piles. Well, Pyle, you so know, if you look at Pyle's kind of work, thing. he did the same thing, and that was yeah. his teacher. Okay. So he was his mentor, yeah. and and he liked what he saw. Yeah, and so he, you know, when you like what you see, there you go. Although uh, the interesting thing is, they were taught that is the students of Pyle in a very basic black and white values uh, environment, uh, mm -hmm. starting with charcoal drawing and graphite mm -hmm. and the literally black and white oil. So you'll see, even with Howard <clears throat> Pyle, um, which also was uh, part of the printing process in early book publishing, uh, which was it was somewhat inferior, make a long story short, till the turn of the century. So black and white reproduced much more easily than color. Color, the four color process came on. But Howard Pyle is black and white and early schoonovers, you can barely tell them apart. Yeah. Because it's so beautifully crafted and you mm -hmm. do see the values, you do see the forms, you do see the depth with no color. Right. All right, so I know you've you've used the term social documentation a couple of times, mm -hmm. and I kind of wanted to round back to a question I had. Um, I had listened to an art talk that you had done. I'm not sure where, but it, it's up on YouTube. I was oh, looking. At, I was looking you up. Whoa, on my website. <laughs> it, uh, so I was listening, and um, I had this question come up. So some people have described Frank's photography as social documentation, and I know you have said before that. Actually, he was he was kind of more interested in just gathering imagery imagery he could use for source material, like you said. Exactly. To be there, you you know you have to experience it to get that real emotional piece out of it. So, um, but I do like how his research kind of accidentally fell into social documentation. <clears throat> um, so, from just the works that I've seen from Frank, he was inspired by kind of the everyday workers, so like coal mine workers and the shoe shiners and the newsies he has in his pieces, and I think that's wonderful. But what do you think he would be inspired by in today's world if he were here and creating, do you think? What I, kind of social documentation do you think he'd be doing? That, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think he'd question. be overwhelmed, of course, at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where do yeah. you start? Uh, I feel that way too, so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, the one yeah. reason that he got into it, of course, was that at the turn of the century, uh, the the whole problem uh, of of using children and women in a negative way in in, in the coal mines and in the mm -hmm. in the silk mills uh, became became a big national. Uh, uh, what do I want to say? Emphasis in the newspaper mm -hmm. and in the new magazines, mm -hmm. uh, Harper's Magazine particularly, uh, wanted to find out what was going on because they'd seen newspaper articles that these children were being used and the women were being right, abused. Right. And so they sent their uh, reporter and grandfather to the two areas to report. And they did report. And it was very much muckraking at its basic, basic uh, starting uh, right there at the turn of the century. And, uh, and with the newsboys as well. Um, so that's why we have uh, this social documentation, because there were a couple of photographers during that time who did some photography, but not to the extent that he did in the areas that he did. Right. The coal mines was well, Louis Hines. Louis Hines, but he was a hired hand hired by the, the federal management to whatever to to expose working conditions. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, so Upton Sinclair obviously comes comes to mind, but these writers focused on these areas of coal mines, silk mills, copper mines. But the, the uh, Scranton, the uh, um, anthracite region, was fairly accessible from Wilmington, so that happened to be the venue where uh, Schoonover uh, did his photography and research. So I think, uh, to answer your question, I think there'd be two areas that he would be interested in. Uh, I think the area uh, around the Texas border mm -hmm. with Mexico would interest him uh, and because of the types of people. Uh, and of course, if he got a news, 
a newspaper or a magazine to send him down there <laughs> like he did mm -hmm. uh, to cover it and photograph it. I think that would might be an area because that's that's the current social problem. The other one that might be uh, interesting to him would be still using these uh, immigrants in sweatshops. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. so if he were hired to do that, that that might be another area. I can't think. I'm sure there are other areas, but to answer your question, do, do you have any other ideas, John, of things that happening now that that would particularly interest him? Well, I mentioned uh, sort of being, I think what he would have done is probably just uh, headed up to Bushkill with his trout trout rod and said, I think I'm better off here. Than, <laughs> that too. Than, Undoubtedly. Than, because, you know, conditions were so different. The media was so different. Uh, and the pace was so different. Uh, and his work sort of captures uh, in an unintentional way, mm -hmm. in a way, uh, um, this... Uh, um, these stories that he illustrated mm -hmm. with his photographic background. One uh, the other, was, excuse me, the uh, yeah. the steerage in New York. Um, Stiglitz, of course, was the photographer photographer known for that. But uh, our grandfather went up there and did this story about uh, the um, Portuguese and Italian. Um, immigrants coming through, uh, and the story was called The Judgment of the Steerage. And those photographs on the revenue cutter are, are really precious. Mm -hmm. They're just precious. Yeah. They're sweet. And he used those for several of the drawings in the, uh, in the published, two published stories, I think. I think. Uh, yeah. Another area uh, that I got involved in uh, was a trip that he took with Howard Pyle and his best friend, Stanley Arthurs, who was one of Howard Pyle's students. And the two of them actually were favorite students of Howard Pyle. <laughs> they considered themselves to be favorites. And just by what we've talked to, you know, different uh, people who've done any history on them or any writing, kind of think the same thing. Mm -hmm. In any case, they went on a trip to Jamaica. And they got on the boat, and they they got to Jamaica, and um, then Howard Pyle, and who must have had his daughter, we believe, with him, went off on a, a local jaunt, and left uh, Stanley and my grandfather to take photographs of the local area. So he took photographs of all the town, the whole town. Uh, in, in in Haiti, they had you know many fishing areas and shacks and very local people and local families and some of the buildings and um, the larger buildings in town. He has all those and we have all those. And two years later, there was a huge earthquake and all those things were destroyed. Oh. So who has the pictures of them? We do. Yeah. We have the pictures that can show what things looked like at that time. Right. You know? And, and that uh, is a good segue into his trip to Europe, which was really um, a more comfortable trip than the four months in Hudson Bay by car with a prosperous uh, friend of his, Wilmington. And they literally toured all through Europe with his camera. And this is pr just pre-World War I. Mm. So again, these photographs will document the towns and the countryside, and there are pictures of the cars stuck in the mud, and then there's pictures of buildings, the, signs. Of buildings and uh, yeah. activities. There's one in the, the book of little German children. Um, and it wasn't uh, too long after that, then, mm. then the war obviously broke out. So there'll be another way to uh, provide uh, source material for um, archivists and historians. Yeah, that really is just a precious yeah. preservation of a world that's just so far away. History, yeah. And yeah. He, we yeah. know exactly, he drew a, a map exactly where they stopped in this big old Pierce Arrow with no top most of the time, <laughs> driving all the way through the Alps. 
I mean, it's a story in itself. Actually, no particular published story for him to illustrate, just his wealth of experience. Uh, again, and, and definitely in the documentary photography domain. Well, there's one other thing I'd like to add, yeah. uh, because I think it's pertinent to his use of color. Uh, he has many colorful, uh, beautiful illustrations and colorful, beautiful uh, landscape work mm -hmm. works. So uh, when we started working on the catalog raisonne, I heard from a man named Mr. Smith. And I thought, Mr. Smith, it could, this could be any of hundreds of people <laughs> in one town even or one city. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, I was a boy who grew up in Bushkill, Pennsylvania. I was a boy who mowed your grandfather's lawn oh, for him. Oh, my goodness. And so we went to Connecticut, and we had lunch with him, and he told us a story and then later put it down in writing, which I still have, of the day that he went over to mow the lawn, and as he was mowing, he got very hot and tired. So he just stopped to take a breath. My grandfather came out, and uh, my grandfather not only had a garden in Wilmington, but he had a huge garden in Bushkill in his big backyard and everything was all planned and diagrammed. We still have diagrams <laughs> of the flowers and the vegetables in his garden in the Delaware Art Museum in his archives in Wilmington, uh, Delaware. And so what he talked to this young boy about was he said, do you see that red gladiola? And he said, yes. He said, do you see the aura of color around the gladiola? He said, and, and, and the boy said, you know, I never could, but I know he could see it. Wow. And that's how he felt about color. He saw it as such beauty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the painter's eye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I do often find myself looking at certain scenes throughout my life and thinking, how would I how would I paint that? <laughs> I bet he was thinking that 24-7. Oh, yeah, <laughs> probably. Oh, that's amazing. So he was drawn to these real-life characters um, because they kind of enhanced the storytelling quality of his art. Um, do you think he was looking for that ethnographic like photo to add to his collection by looking for these characters do you think he what do you think his his main focus for his subjects were uh i think having now um reviewed all that photography and his references to the photographs throughout his now mind you he kept a diary Yes, he kept an accounting diary. He also kept a uh, chronological numeric record called day books of his 2510 paintings. All those, they're all entered. Well, almost all of them. Book. Yeah, there's a few missing. <laughs> a few but missing then, and sometimes he, doubled. And, you yeah, know, he, kid, was a, yeah. he was an artist, but he was an amazing record um, keeper. But how lovely so, to so, have those records. Oh, well, we couldn't have done the book without it. Oh, man. That, no. And now we find that he did, with his photographs, alphanumeric cataloging wow. of yeah. all those photographs. But what you see is his, his inclination to meet and talk and spend time with the people, you know, to gain some knowledge of the surroundings, of their activities, of their thoughts, to the point where, back to the Canadian trip, and by the way, the winter trip was followed by a summer trip in 1911, um, is that the uh, Cree referred to him as the, uh, gosh, the Cree word's going to slip right now. Um, I can see it on the paper, but it, it was a Cree word for the picture-making man. Oh. <laughs> and part of that was a reference to him holding his camera in front of them where they were not particularly at ease initially. Mm -hmm. And he describes that in his uh, diary. Yeah. But um, I think that's there's that uh, want to know more of the subjects he was encountering right. 
wherever he traveled. He would do a number of things to get a, a photograph. Yeah. He, uh, one of the uh, articles that I'm writing for uh, through his lens is about his trip to the West. And he went up to the uh, Montana area, Missoula, Montana, because there was all the problem up there with uh, the copper mines. You see, copper runs underground. You know, the copper veins run underground. Now, if Joe Blow owns one property and Sam Spade owns the next property, who owns the right. copper that goes under it. So there was a huge hue and cry and fight. So he was hired to go and take photographs up there. But when he got to M Missoula, Montana, he saw that, oh, there was going to be a sun dance in, with the Indian tribe about probably, oh, I don't know how many miles, but it was outside of town. And the sun dance was a very interesting a celebration to the sun uh, that the Indians gathered for, and they would tie uh, long strings, sinews, into their back skin, the skin of their oh back, and attach it to a pole, and then lean against it. Oh, and they would attach man. it to their front and lean against it for as long as they could till they passed My out. Goodness. That was the Sundance. The Sundance has been, uh, uh, well, they've absolutely forbidden it. The government has forbidden them to do it anymore. But he went to it and he walked around <sighs> and he took photographs yeah. of many of the things. Uh, and they, uh, he writes the story in one of the, the magazines that he wrote about this experience that he opened a flap of a tent because there were lots of tents around, opened a flap of a tent, and there was uh, a, 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 uh, a man, an Indian uh, inside. He called them all Indians, by the way. I know we call them Ameri Native Americans, but mm -hmm. just for the sake of it. Right, right. Um, there he was doing a face painting on a little girl, because that was one of the things they did. And, and they were very frightened to see him with his camera. And they went like this, you know, and they threw the flap shut, he oh. said. And then he said, but I was not to be stopped. And he opened the flap and threw some coins in on the blanket. And they let him take some photographs of this. And there was a very famous painting that my grandfather did an illustration of wow. the face painter. So he essentially paid for the rights he to essentially take a photograph. Paid. Yes, yeah. he did. Wow. Uh, so there were all kinds of ways to get yeah. good photographs and basics. Uh, information for paintings. Well, as, yeah, as you were talking about him visiting with the Native Americans, I was wondering if he was welcome here. Did he, did they let him stay with them? Like, what was the situation there, if you know? Seemed very comfortable. Nancy Wyeth went out and did the same thing. Matter of fact, he and my grandfather corresponded often. Uh, and of course, um, he illustrated. My grandfather wasn't really a Western artist, no. but um, he's admired for his work uh, for Western illustrations for Western stories. Mm -hmm. And you can see those photographs, as uh, Phoebe was mentioning, uh, well, based on those based on those uh, compositions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one's called the Sun Priest, which Sun is Priest, a particularly yeah. uh, stunning. I'll have to uh, see that one. Uh, at the it, Delaware Art Museum. It's beautiful at the Delaware Art Museum, yeah. and it's on display always because it's such a, an interesting work. Yeah. It's, you know, especially with the new, not new, but the recent and in the last 20 years emphasis on the Native Americans and their mm -hmm. contribution. Uh, and it's a painting of, of a, uh, I think it's a, a witch doctor who is uh, painting a white buffalo skin. Now, white buffalo skins were very rare and very valuable. And painting it to, you know, for his his own decoration, because wow. and all kinds of things hanging on the tent, you know, so that was very, he could take photographs and then replicate. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. you, you were just talking about the Delaware Museum of Art. Um, are you guys frequently involved with them or do you mm -hmm. do you visit or anything like that? Well, I, I visit them often because 
Uh, we live right behind it, Fran That's and lovely. I do. <laughs> and um, Great. the studios are another uh, 10 blocks the other direction. And, um, of course, um, they have the premier collection of Howard Pyle, which is why the museum's there. And uh, grandfather was one of the incorporators. But um, we try to work with them in terms of promoting uh, illustration, which is a very, very important <clears throat> part of their collection. Mm -hmm. um, the other half being the pre-Raphaelites, for which there's known quite well, actually internationally. And they actually have a, a illustration exhibit called Illustration During the Jazz Era, 20s and 30s. And I think that'll be a very appropriate um, uh, exhibit to kind of embellish that sort of unique, uh, when the flappers and the yes. easy speakeasies and all that kind of crazy behavior. Right. And into the 30s, which became a little bit different, obviously. Right, right. So there'll be some of granddad's work. But, you know, that's um, of great interest to us yeah. on behalf of the field of illustration. Right, right. Have they asked you to help with any records or anything like that? With well, with the uh, well, yeah, well, I didn't get to that part. The library is oh, well, the, oh. they have an the extensive library ar okay. Okay. and all of our grandfather's uh, archival uh, materials are there. His yeah. letters, his uh, business interactions, uh, all of his photographs, many of his glass slides that were that you know were turned into photographs. Uh, even some of the costuming are in boxes wow. in that you know, uh, in that collection. And it's maintained by a wonderful uh, uh, librarian named Rachel Diolutario. And she happens to be on our board as well. So oh, we have yeah, a librarian yeah. on our board. But in any case... Um, that's where we go for all the research. Right. That's mm -hmm. where we do a lot of research. Sort of right, home, right. That's at sort of home base, which you yeah, think I, it's been a home been base for okay. a number of years, and yeah. they've been very cooperative. And so, yeah, yeah, it's it's really been a great connection. Now, I remember when I was a child going up to visit my grandmother and grandfather, and that's what we did on Sunday afternoon. We went to church in the morning, and in the afternoon, we walked over to the museum and looked at all the paintings. Yeah. And my grandmother would comment on all the paintings that were up. And speaking of paintings that are up, uh, there is a permanent collection uh, of uh, illustrators. And almost always Hans Brinker uh, is in there and the Sun Priest. So those are the two that almost never go anywhere. And if they do, they come back and mm -hmm. they put them straight up. They don't put them down on the racks in the basement. Yeah. Those are, those are the precious ones. Those are precious <laughs> ones. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, and so it's wonderful to have an association with them since my grandfather was one of the uh, incorporators uh, originally, the the group that originally started that museum. Yeah, it was after Howard Pyle died, interestingly. He died in Italy, and they never brought him home. So uh, his widow was very cooperative in uh, working with the community. Right. Uh, in preserving Pyle's heritage. Yes. Uh, and it, and working with benefactors, the Bancroft. Yeah. So that sort of... That's good. ...started... Uh, that's how that museum got started. Yeah. It's not unusual these days for for museums to to evolve out of a major collection. Right. Yeah. It just takes one big donation, and then you have oh, a, that you suddenly have too. a. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what they'd like, actually. I mean, look at the <laughs> right, Norman, right. Look They're at the really Nor working on that right look now. Look at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Yeah. yeah. Boom. Right. There it is, and it's a wonderful. Museum. They had an exhibit, a Schoonover, in 2018. Mm -hmm. Major exhibit. Uh, Wonderful. And the Delaware Art Museum also had a major exhibition in 2009 when the when the catalog came out. They yeah. did a, a wonderful uh, ex exhibition. Great. Um, so, well, to end off this conversation, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about when that? publications coming out next year. So we have something to look forward to. Well, um, our latest <laughs> um, meeting with the uh, University of Delaware Press 
uh, was, uh, I would say, very successful in that they ex expressed um, a strong interest in publishing it. And, and it's really um, perfect because uh, we have a wonderful association with the University of Delaware. My sister is a graduate. Our daughter, Janine, and uh, who else? Oh, my grandfather is a honorary uh, had yeah, an honorary 19, degree. 1963, 63. when I graduated, he got an honorary yeah. degree. And they, and they have a number of Schoonover paintings. Yeah, they do in uh, their collection. In their halls. So, boom, they went, hey. So, next year, 2025, if. <laughs> if we get it all to them. <laughs> if we <laughs> get on, hey, you want a date? I'll give it to you. <laughs> April 17th, they said, bring us your material. And by that, they mean bring us substantial material, mm -hmm. your text and your selection of photographs, they would, um, I would say, hopefully, um, take that and sort of create a format because they would do a lot of the layout Great. and they have to determine pages, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and eventually uh, what kind of costs are involved. And if they feel that um, the material is um, strong enough, why well, I think they'll, they'll, to use a good word, press on mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to next year. They, you know, a year is not unusual right. in terms of lag time right. to do uh, even, you know, post-editing and, mm -hmm. and uh, formatting. Well, thanks to Frank and his extensive record keeping, you thankfully have plenty of material to send oh, them. Oh, it's I'm over. Sure. <laughs> it's overwhelming. I mean, yeah. we might have dug three quarters of the way through this material because there's letter references, there are telegrams, and anytime there's references to a painting, you might find a photograph that uh, is is behind that. And um, and then there's the ones he took sort of casually yeah. that are artistic, literally just have, a, uh, have that quality. And just literally let you look into a moment of his life at that time. Fishing. There's a whole article he yeah. wrote on fishing. Oh, yeah. Which oh, is, yes. I hope, fascinating. <laughs> I'm not a fisherman. Uh, well, I'll be looking forward to Jean Lafitte, the pirate. Yeah, you'll like that. <laughs> you'll like that chapter. Oh, that's wonderful. I didn't include it in our little sample. I think it. No, It'll no, be more can, mysterious when we get there. It, yeah. Yeah. There we go. John well, and Louise. So we gosh. might be back with a book in a year or so to see the wonderful museum again and oh, talk yes. with you. We thank you very much for having yeah, us thank you. into your studio yes. and for uh, letting us share our, our thoughts and uh, wonderful remembrances of my grandfather. Yes, so. I so appreciate you guys stopping by. NCY in the Golden Age of American Illustration is on display in Sampa's galleries until March 31st of 2024. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you. Thank you. Wonderful.